This is Rick Rule for Sprott US Media. Today I have the uh, pleasure of interviewing Lobo Tigre, uh, a longtime friend and also a longtime associate in natural resource investing and speculating. Um, Lobo, as many of you know, uh, publishes uh, a newsletter called The Independent Speculator. And those of you who don't know that should know that. Lobo, first of all, welcome to Sprott. Thank you very much. It's good to be on the show. Let's jump right into this. Uh, the first thing I'd like you to do is talk, talk to me about really why somebody should subscribe to Independent Speculator. What is the value proposition like? Let's get right at it. What are you trying to do for people? What sets you apart from the sort of 15 or 20 uh, newsletters that have survived in natural resource and precious metal speculation? Got it. Well, the first thing is that people should know that I did work for Doug Casey at Casey Research for almost 14 years. During that time, the international speculator uh, for which I wrote, and I was basically Doug's due diligence guy. I went around, kicked rocks and picked stocks, as they used to say. The average gain during my tenure with that letter was about 18.6% um, per year. And that included the meltdown of 2008, the terrible resource market after 2011, 2012. So I consistently beat the market in my previous days. That included my learning curve. And so I believe that I'm gonna do better. Forward looking statement there. I believe I'm gonna do even better, past performance, no guarantee, all that sort of stuff. But I am now bringing uh, basically 15 years of learning from masters like you and my friend Doug Casey and others uh, to the service of my readers. So you would suggest that the first thing that people look at is the track record, which is of course an important thing. Tell me something besides the track record, let's be really forward, looking, forward thinking, uh, that separates you from the other letter writers in terms of specific capabilities. The marketing guys say I should promise that I have this special deal that if you sign up right away, you're going to make thousands of percent overnight. Uh, and I would actually say this is another distinguishing characteristic of mine is that I don't pretend to have a crystal ball. I never tell people, this is what will happen. This is what I know will happen. What I do is I say, these are the outcomes. This is the one I think is most likely. Here's what's possible. Here's what to do in either case. And ideally, we find something that's a win-win. It wins in either case. And so I think something that can people can look for in my work is a reasonableness, an appeal to reason rather than emotion. And I think that directly translates to that track record and results. If you want to ask me what I'm excited about right now, I can certainly tell you. Um, but you won't get this grand prediction of, you know, this crisis or, or you know, something going to the moon tomorrow because that's not what I do. Am I correct in summarizing what you just said uh, <laughs> very simply uh, that you're actually delivering speculative advice rather than uh, advertising copy? Is that? <laughs> that is my intent. I would say guidance. Uh, I'm very careful not to give any advice, of course, stay clear of the SEC. And this could be good or bad, something else people should know. The entire portfolio of my letter, I don't just disclose where I've invested. Uh, the whole idea of that portfolio is that it's only things I'm willing to put my own money into. Something has to be good enough for me to put my own hard-earned money into it or I don't write about it. So it's, uh, I think it's a reality check, it's an integrity check, um, but it also says something about what I'm doing and why and how, you know, how firmly I believe in my thesis. Well, I think that's very important. You know, the, uh, some of the larger publishers uh, require that their editors don't own anything they talk about. My own belief is that that's exactly wrong, uh, that the editors should be required to own what they recommend and they should uh, be required to recommend selling it before they in fact liquidate their own positions. The editors are of course, or the publishers are concerned about front running and you eliminate the probability of front running by making the editor follow on. So I, I frankly love the fact that you own everything you talk about. Let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of things that you think in your formative years at Casey that you did right and that you did wrong. What do you think uh, contributed to your uh, track record at Casey uh, and what do you think was detrimental to your track record in Casey and what can investors or speculators learn from the 15 years of apprenticeship that you put in? Uh, hard and great questions, Rick. Um, 
in terms of the, let's take the negative first, because I did make some mistakes. And to share a little credit there, I think I was perhaps uh, thrown in the water to sink or swim a bit earlier than I should have been. Uh, but that did make me learn. And perhaps, uh, you know, those mistakes are the best teachers. Um, and as far as a unifying theme and where I would take, you know, my own responsibility for that, I would probably say hubris. I had some really good successes early on, and this made me, uh, I think, uh, as Bill Bonner says, confuse a, an uptick in the market for my own personal genius. <laughs> and then 2008 came along and, and quickly disabused me of that notion. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm no dummy, and I know that. And there's a danger when you know you're, you're clever and you can see other people's errors to overestimate your own, uh, or maybe overestimate the strength of your own intelligence and what it means in something so vast and difficult to figure as global markets. Uh, so if I, <laughs> if I have advice to pass on stroking my long white beard, it's, it's self-knowledge, including a little humility. Now, on the upside, I did uh, make some mistakes and some very specific, uh, very painful ones that I'll, I'll never repeat again. And, and specific lessons, not just, oh, you know, bull market can fool you into being overly optimistic. You know, specific trading things like looking very carefully at the terms of a takeover. Is it all cash? Is it shares or is it a mix? Uh, as a, a vastly different um, trading result for the person who's in the stock that's being taken over, which a lot of our friends in junior resources often are, you know, that, that sort of thing really stays with you. And, you know, just the cumulative experiences of the worst uh, disasters in my past, and there have been some painful ones, you know, some of them share common themes, like not having a full bankable feasibility study, something looking so good that the miners rushed in. And in my personal experience, that has worked out disastrously. I wouldn't say 100% of the time, but most of the time. Uh, things like that I've carried forward and now hope to be able to deliver based on that experience for my readers. And I mean, I get the self-knowledge part. Uh, I've had actually a couple more cycles to learn my own frailty. So I'm, <laughs> I'm empathetic, which is always more sincere than sympathetic. Moving beyond, however, teaching yourself to be a speculator, are there some things about speculative markets or exploration markets that you think you do better or less well than other competitors? I'm pausing rather than just to say great question to fill the time because I, I think that deserves a good answer. And I would say I'm, I've, I've been accused of being a real cold fish. I'm not the friendliest sort of person unless you get to know me really well. I, I don't do small talk very well. You know, I go to these trips to look at the companies and all I care about is the rocks and the drilling and the plant and things. I, I don't, I don't want to go fishing afterwards or whatever. So in some ways that dispassionate evaluation of the opportunities is I think a great asset. It's, um, I don't get emotionally carried away or wedded to the stocks. You know, as our friend Doug likes to say, these are burning matches. So I don't hold them so long I get burned because I just can't bear to let, you know, my darling go. Uh, on the other hand, I think sometimes that makes me disconnect with uh, some of my readers and the market because I am considerably more restrained and, and disciplined than the average person out there. And when a trend is going, it's going and my reason tells me, oh, it's, this is overpriced, I shouldn't chase this. Um, but when something's really going, there's a lot of money I've left on the table by getting out too early. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe early is better than late at a loss, but it is something that I wrestle with, you know, understanding that I am not the market and the market will not do what I think makes sense. Uh, I think that's a very defensible error. Um... Bernard Baruch was famous for saying, the only person who ever bought at the bottom and sold at the top was a liar. It didn't happen. Uh, and the truth is that I believe that uh, being early is better than the alternative. But let's move on. Um, you say the rocks. Uh, tell me how, if I remember correctly, your formal education was in physics. Uh, a physics major who ran nonprofits could transition into knowing enough geology 
that he could make a living being a professional speculator in the exploration market. Tell me how that works. Yeah, well, it gets worse. I actually, I started out as a physics major, ended up with a BA in sociology of all things. <laughs> Long story we don't need to get into. Um, but yes, I was, I was a writer, not a geologist, when Doug took me under his wing and, and taught me the ropes. Um, but I guess <laughs> the honest answer is really just passion. I always loved geology, even if I never studied it. I was that sort of obnoxious person who would slow down driving on the highway because the road cutting uh, went through some interesting geology. You could see it exposed on the side of the road. And you wonder, how the heck do those rocks get twisted in that way? What happened there? Uh, and now I know <laughs> it's so exciting to uh, travel the world and look at amazing geology all around the world. And, and I just love it. And when you want to learn something, I firmly believe that's the best time to learn. Uh, and I had not only the advantage of wanting to learn it, but because of the nature of the business that we're in, you know, Doug sent me out to go check out something and they'd send their best geologist to talk to me and explain things. And often, you know, you remember the Explorers League that Casey Research created. I was kicking rocks with world-class geologists. I mean, absolute best of class, you know, people like Dick Silito or, or Ron Peratt in Nevada, Andy Wallace, very famous people who've made multiple discoveries, which is so far out there on the bell curve of results. And to be able to spend days hiking down these canyons and kicking rocks, and yes, sometimes the geologists do lick them, you know, <laughs> just like Stinky Pete and, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Ranger, that really does happen and there's a reason for it. Um, it was just wonderful. I, I loved it. I enjoyed it. And I think that has a lot to do with how quickly I learned. I, I, Doug's partner, David Glenn, said I took to it like a fish to water. I think it's exactly right. I was a thirsty fish and I enjoyed it so much that, uh, you know, I, I still have no degree in it. I haven't had time to sit down and take a college degree in, in any sort of geology. But over a decade and a half, I have seen a lot of rocks. Uh, I think a lot more than the average college graduate has by the time he gets out of school. And I've seen them in the company of successful geoscientists who've made economic discoveries, not just academics. And I think that's an important difference. I think that's probably right. Uh, I, I joke that the School of Hard Knocks is uh, the best possible uh, education for somebody in our business. Let's move from uh, rocks to people. I think it was Mark Twain, Twain that famously said that uh, a miner is best defined as a liar standing next to a hole in the ground. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism of extractive industries, exploration uh, businesses for having, let's be polite and say, less than candid uh, disclosure and promotion. Uh, how did you develop your, for want of a better phrase, BS filter? How did you uh, avoid being taken in by the Bay Street or House Street scams? Well, this may go back to the character traits you asked about, the plus side of being a cold fish, and also not quite a teetotaler, but not a heavy drinker, is you know, <laughs> taking me out and whining me and dining me makes no difference. I, I don't care if they put me up in a five-star resort to go look at their locks. All I care about is, you know, can I see what they're trying to achieve? Does it look realistic? Do they have the budget? You know, just the facts, ma'am. Um, so I think that's part of it. But the reality is that I did get lied to. I, I can think of specific people who lied to my face. And I have a list. There is a no-fly list, as far as I'm concerned, of some companies don't care how great it looks. Uh, if these people are on the board or in management, I do not invest. Um, but I would say that that developed over time, not just the list. You know, my, my predisposition to not being, you know, easily wined and dined is part of it, but more like after a few disappointments, after being lied to, right? or even not lied to, but just the lily got gilded so often that I've just come to assume bullshit on everything. Even the very best in the business are going to present things in the best possible way. That doesn't mean they're lying, but it does mean they're gonna put their best forward. And okay, fair enough, I'm an analyst, I'm supposed to figure that out. They're, they do their best job to sell what they're selling, I do my best job to resist that sales pitch. And so the default assumption is that, you know, assume they're telling you the best possible scenario and it's your job to be extremely skeptical of that and poke holes in it. How about the value of narrative? Uh, your principal mentor, Doug Casey, who's been an important uh, mentor of mine, I think possessed a journalist's sixth sense 
uh, about the value of a narrative on a market. Uh, it isn't a skill that I shared with him, but how important to you is the narrative and how important to you is the promotional plan and the team's ability to lower their cost of capital through effective promotion? Well, Doug did teach me that promotion is one of his eight P's or nine P's, depending on how you count them, of, of resource stock evaluation. And I certainly do care that a company has the ability to get its story out there, that kind of promotion. But I'd say the bigger uh, narrative picture really isn't with the company, but with the market. When, when the market got the lithium bit in its teeth a few years ago, I mean, there was just no stopping the lithium place or the rare earths or any other flavor of the day. Uh, in fact, I've really come to think of the flavor of the day as a misnomer. It's almost never a day. A, a good resource sector flavor of the day is often a year or two. Um, so if you become aware of a flavor of the day, like lithium or the rare earths or cobalt a couple of years ago, um, gosh, a couple of years ago already. Uh, if you become aware of that within a few months, then it's reasonable to assume that this flavor of the year or two uh, still has some legs. And if you can find a story that the market is responding to and the narrative remains strong, that is a reasonable basis for speculation. Now, the other P's need to be ticked. You still need to kick the rocks. And I would prefer to bet on a company that actually has something, not just the uh, storium, as you like to say. Uh, but fitting into the narrative, I think, is an important part of, of the overall story. Interesting. Following on that theme, uh, knowing you fairly well, uh, you don't seem, you don't seem to, have to have been, been uh, attracted, attracted either, either uh, to the substance or the narrative in the cannabis space, which so many of your, uh, your fellows uh, in speculative resources have been drawn to. Do you, is that a discipline of your own? Uh, I'm not going to talk about your personal life, but in terms of your investment life, to avoiding the cryptocurrencies as an example or narrative, or, or pardon me, uh, cannabis or narratives that are believed to be in an investment sense analogous to mining, but you seem to have avoided those spaces. I would say yes and no. And I would give credit to Doug here, where he does seem to have a sixth sense here. And unbelievably to me, he bought into a bunch of pot stock stories uh, while they were still private. And he hates private companies. But he really believed that narrative, if you will. Um, but the, the conservatism there on my part isn't really just, oh, well, you know, marijuana, that's too weird or different, or I'm just a metals and mining guy. Uh, you know, I'm quite willing to speculate on anything I'm truly convinced is a great speculation. But I know what I know. I know my limitations. I know what I don't know. And I don't know squat about growing pot or that industry. And I could see the story. I could see, oh, legalization is coming. Somebody's going to make a bunch of money doing this. That I got. That part of the story I got. But my own ability to discern which companies <laughs> were going to cash in and which ones would be a dot-com bust... I had no confidence whatsoever in my ability to choose there. So I just stayed out. I understood I would potentially be leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, same with the cryptos. I, I got it. I, and I get the, the distributed ledger technology and the potential there. My own ability to tell which crypto is going to be the Amazon or cryptos or whatever, I have zero confidence that I'm the man to make that call. So. I've been very, very cautious. And okay, I probably have given up on some 20 baggers in doing that. Um, but I believe in getting rich on process. I know that what I do works. I know I can deliver results. And I'd rather stick with what I know and only go out on a limb when I really, like, I have to be very convinced. And I think that's a good thing for my readers to know. If I do go beyond my own potatoes, what I know well, then the case is extremely compelling. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about going out on a limb, and let's also talk about thematic investing. investing. You talked, you talked about, about the fact that, that when, as an example, metal. certain metals like cobalt or lithium run, they really run. Uh, you also talked earlier in this interview about forward-looking statements. So let me see, as an interviewer, if I can drag some forward-looking statements out of you. Looking forward 12 to 18 months, 
Uh, do you think that there are any overlooked themes in uh, the exploration or extractive speculation that you'd like to pay attention to uh, and draw your readers' attention to? Yes, I would modulate, not modulate, moderate your question a little bit and change. Not exactly overlooked within the resource sector, but overlooked within the broader markets for sure, and that is the uranium space. I, I am very, very convinced uh, that the fundamentals here is just a one-way street ahead. The stuff cannot be mined at current prices. And yes, secondary supply was swamping demand for some time, and we saw, that's why prices we saw go below cost of production. Um, but you can't have the lights turn on in large parts of the world without uranium. And you can't replace it with windmills or thorium or anything else in less than decades. So the stuff will have to be mined, and it can't be mined at current prices. Therefore, prices will go up. I feel very rarely do I feel so confident using the word will and not just should or may. But in this case, I do feel that way. And where it fits with your overlooked thing is that a lot of resource investors are aware of the uranium story. I think many of them are thrice bitten, twice shy because there have been failed rallies in uranium before. I do think this year is different. I think the rise that we've seen is both higher and broader, and we're seeing a series of higher lows, which my technical friends tell me is very important. Uh, but most importantly, if, say, the Japanese, with their shutdown reactors, were still flooding the market with excess secondary supply, I think we would have seen uh, you know, the, the price rise go back down again much more than we have. So I do think this time is different. I do think it goes only in one direction with volatility along the way. And it's something that most investors, maybe resource investors are aware of it, but most investors are certainly not. Uh, if they read about uranium at all, and you know they think Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima, it's a terrible thing, nobody wants to go there. Uh, but it's, it's very strong in the fundamentals. And on top of that, we have a unique circumstance right now where the US is looking at its foreign dependence on uranium imports. And it uses, uh, Uranium to or nuclear power generates about 20% of the electricity in the United States, and the U.S. imports about 95% plus of its uranium. So the Department of Commerce was petitioned to look into this. President Trump is now uh, has that report on his desk. He has two months left to respond. And it's very, very difficult for me to imagine Mr. Trump, Mr. America first, not thinking, hmm, we depend 95% on imported uranium. We've got to do something about that. Never say never. I could be wrong, but this could potentially really light a fire under U.S. uranium place. And if it doesn't, the fundamentals are still strong, very, very strong. So I see this um, as an asymmetrical risk situation where either uranium goes up or it goes up a lot. And these U.S. plays, either they go up with uranium as it does, when it does, or they go up a lot if Trump helps them out. And the best part about this was to your question. I think this is largely overlooked by the broader investment world. We see the uranium stocks, the more notable ones, they sell off with the broader market. On days like today, when the Wall Street uh, you know, indices, they take a hit, the more notable uranium stocks, they tend to take a hit as well. And that happens even at the same time that uranium prices go up. So there's a big disconnect with most investors out there. And at some point when the uranium price starts really moving, I think people will wake up and maybe if that happens at a time when the broader markets are desperate for good news, you know, everything's going down. Where's the bright spot? Where's the bright spot? If uranium provides that bright spot, we could see a real stampede into what is a very small sector and, and prices could do extremely well. There's your forward looking statement. Just for the record, I agree with it. Uh, I would uh, amplify it by saying that uh, the resource market's memory of the last uranium bull market is strong enough that if you give those few remaining resource investors an excuse to crowd into the uranium space, they will certainly do it with the belief that uh, past was prologue. Uh, I would also suggest that, as you have said, with regards to an increase in uranium price, the question that you're asking is when, not I if. Am and when questions are high quality questions. However, my clients and your readers are concerned about when. So do you have a sense in your own mind as to when uranium and hence uranium equities might respond? 
I suspect that it will take a, a breakout or a visible awareness that this rally that we've seen this year, even with the correction, is different. You know, it goes on maybe $30. I think it's a price trigger. I th will it be when uranium prices cross $30? Maybe, maybe not. You know. uh, but once it starts hitting $40, which gets close to average cost of production, it starts changing the dynamics. The lower cost uh, producers who are now idle or have idled assets start coming back into the market. I think that starts getting people excited. And as you say, I, I do think there are people with fairly recent memory of uranium making them very, very happy. And all they need is to see it starting and to be convinced that it's starting again. And I do think we see a, a big rush in there. Uh, and let me add one more thing, though. Uh, if you remember, of course you remember, when uranium spiked last time, it went way, way up vertical to what is, was obviously an unsustainable price. And then it came back to near the cost of production. And then it started up again until Fukushima hit. Um, so what I'm saying is don't hold it too long. When this mania really gets going, it's likely to go vertical and then correct sharply. Now, to add to your question for when to get in, if I didn't own any uranium stocks today, and I do have several that I think are poised to benefit from the things that we're talking about in my portfolio right now, and I'm looking to add to that, one of the few things I'm looking to actually buy right now on market weakness, if I didn't have that, I would buy now, and I wouldn't worry about where the bottom was, because uranium reacts to these different contractual movements. This could start moving any day. Or Trump could make his decision. He doesn't, for all his volatility and unpredictability, he doesn't seem to me to be a procrastinator. So <laughs> I could see, you know, I could see Trump lighting a fire under the uranium market tomorrow. So if I was short right now or, I, or out of this space, I would look to buy on down days like today uh, without... Uh, without hesitation. I would not hesitate about that. And I wouldn't worry about things possibly going lower because I'd be in and I'd know I was in. Um, but if this trade war thing really shakes up Wall Street, we saw a big shakeup today and, and people remember what happened last fall. That pain is very recent in a lot of investors' memories. And as you commented, you know, people will remember their recent experiences. So if they think, oh, no, it's going to happen again, I think we see a mass exodus from Wall Street. I think we can see a major meltdown this summer. Sell in May may turn out to be the best advice for mainstream investors this year. Uh, and that could be happening now. If that happens, uh, these uranium stocks, no matter how great their fundamentals are, they're likely to get hit as well. So I wouldn't go all in right now. I would make sure I had a stake because, like I said, who knows what Trump will do tomorrow. Um, but after that initial stake is in, I'd hold my gunpowder, some significant chunk of it dry to see if we get a meltdown in Wall Street in the weeks or months ahead, because that could create some truly spectacular buying opportunities, which I think would be right before the big rally. Uh, let me paraphrase that by saying that you're uh, saying to the people listening to this interview that resource stocks are stocks. And at least in the near term, when stocks go down, Resource stocks or all tertiary, tertiary assets, assets. Uh, react. Is that accurate? It's, it's truly accurate. And we've seen this repeatedly. Sometimes it makes no sense. Something that's the best thing to have under these circumstances. Why is it selling off? Well, because it is the best thing and therefore can get a bid. You remember in 2008 when you couldn't get a bid on, on almost anything and gold sold off, it wasn't because gold was bad or forgot its job. It's because there were willing buyers. And you could sell your gold when you got your margin calls, when you couldn't sell anything else. So we could see that happen to uranium stocks because that's the way the market works. I want to ask you a further question on uranium markets that goes to your journalistic sense. Both Doug Casey and David Galland, people who have been important in your past and mine, have said that they suspect that the greatest speculative market opportunities of all times lie ahead of us as a consequence of a connected world and the fact that a powerful narrative can be shared more quickly than ever before. Um, and that uh, collective hysteria uh, takes place much more rapidly now. Do you think that there is uh, in the uranium space the possibility for positive hysteria? Or do you think among connected and millennial investors that the uh, specter of Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki 
will keep this from being the type of uh, mania that Doug Casey or David Galland suggest that it could as a consequence of technology? Let me parse that. I do not think the millennials not participating would in any way hold this back. The silver hairs among us have that memory of the big rally from 2000 to 2007, and there are enough of them left that this could go completely just based on their recent uh, wonderful, non-painful experiences. Uh, that said, I do think there is actually a narrative upside. But let me let me be perfectly frank with the audience here. There is one thing I think that could be fatal to my thesis on this, and one reason why I don't put all my eggs in this basket, and that is there could be another accident. Now we've learned from each accident, and and actually nobody died from the meltdown at Fukushima, or Three Mile Island, uh, and it's arguable, you know, about Chernobyl. Um, these accidents are big in people's mind, and even if they're not as scary or bad as all the hype and the media make them out to be, the hype in the media is there. So if there were to be another accident that could and almost certainly would completely knock the stuffing out of everything that I'm saying. Now these accidents are, have been very few and far between. Each time we've gotten better. I mean, in Fukushima, it wasn't the reactors necessarily. It was the generators to keep them cool that were flooded by a tsunami. Um, you know, that's not going to happen again. So. I don't expect this to happen, but I have to say this is the one thing that could torpedo the whole idea. It's a very rare occurrence, but it could and would torpedo the whole idea. Now that said, as far as the narrative goes, one of the things that's really, really striking to see is that the uh, climate change warriors are starting to get on the nuclear bandwagon. I, when, when we first started writing about this in the early aught aughts, there was one. It was uh, Patrick Moore, the Greenpeace founder, was saying, you know what? Right. You know, maybe we ought to think about nuclear power. It doesn't emit carbon. And he was like this loony, you know, out there in the woods, you know, chirping by himself. Nobody listened to him. But now it's becoming a movement. And there, uh, you know, if you start searching for nuclear power on, on Internet, you start finding amongst the first page full of results in Google, you start seeing these presentations that are pro-nuclear power. And it's not just from engineers or ex-NASA guys who, who love technology. You're seeing it from, uh, you know, environmental, hardcore environmentalists. You're seeing it from even places like NPR uh, and the Washington Post. And, you know, left-leaning journalists are starting to see, well, maybe we should reconsider this. Why is this happening? Because they're failing to meet their carbon reduction goals. They have all these lofty goals about how they're going to save the planet. They're trying to prevent it from warming a half a degree over the next 20 years. And, you know, oddly enough, people still want to eat and people still want jobs. And most of the world is still struggling to rise up and their priorities are not on carbon reduction. And so these goals are not being met. And I think there's, this is, now this is me guessing, theorizing here, but I think there's a growing sense of genuine panic in that camp where these people believe that if we don't make X changes within the next 12 years, to use AOC's famous time frame, you know, that irrevocable harm will be done and, you know, life itself is threatened. This is an existential threat to this mindset, as in war, like all out war. And in that case, you know, sometimes you make friends uh, and, and allies with people that maybe you don't like so much. So I'm not promising this, but I see a, a, a budding groundswell here on what used to be the hardcore opposition to nuclear power really turning around. It's quite striking used to see it in, in outlet after outlet, people saying, hmm, you know, maybe we should rethink this thing. Uh, that could put, uh, you know, that could bring the millennials to bear in a positive way on this story in, you know, in a way we've never seen. Lobo, I look forward to seeing uh, AOC on your uh, subscriber roster. That will, uh, that will certainly be an amusing time uh, for me and a challenging time for her. Albert is signaling to me that I've gone over time, but I'd like to thank you for taking the time to interview with us. And I don't want to miss the opportunity to encourage the listeners to this to come hear your presentation at the Sprott Vancouver Natural Resources Investment Symposium. Information associated with attending that symposium will, of course, be appended to this video. And I look forward to people approaching you, Lobo, 
signing up for your uh, free service and determining for themselves uh, whether or not your paid service, which I personally recommend, fits their speculative needs. Thank you once again and my regards to Antonia. Thank you, Rick. Much appreciated. Thank you.